much for coming. If you're visiting with us, man, I, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you for choosing us. Uh, first time is always kind of a difficult time for a lot of people. Uh, it is for me, and, and we know that it takes, uh, takes a little willpower to come and be here. Thank you. Thank you, and, and we hope that we're a blessing to you. Uh, I want to see your, your face. Shake your hand on the way out the door. Thanks for coming. It's good to be here in, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you so much for the day that you have made. Father, what a, what a great the, the coolness and the sunshine, the blue skies. Father, only by you could we enjoy such a beautiful day. But Father, we want your presence here in this building this morning. We've come from all different directions, Father. Some of us have you know, worked through the middle of struggle. Some of us have been out climbing mountains and, and shooting elk this, this, this week, Lord. And, and so we come from many different directions. But Father, we come for one thing. We come to be in your presence and to feel your love. God, just to, to feel your spirit, just to reach down and touch our lives. Bless Brother Matt. Father, it's good to have him back. And bless the praise team. We want to just worship you and praise you. Let us set aside the burdens that we've carried all week. Let us feel your love. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Church, are you ready to see who's next? Welcome to week two of interviews of how the Ridge has impacted your life. My name is Katie Harmon. My name is Yvette Eichelman. And I'm Fred Eichelman. Hi, I'm Patty Pounds, and, and I have. Oh, sorry, start over. Well, you go right ahead. We're supposed to tell how many months. Oh. Okay. Hi, I'm Patty Pounds. And I'm Robbie Pounds. And we're, we're all, all in. in. And we've been coming to the Ridge Church for about four months now. How would you describe the Ridge overall? I would describe the Ridge overall as a family, really. Uh, it just doesn't feel like church I don't know it do, it's church obviously but it's just so much more than that it's it's a community it's family it's you know a sense of home um, it's just such a profound difference from any other church experience that I've ever had so that I think that that's the best way to describe it it's just it's it's comfortable you know it's really nice once a week I get to come to a church where I feel like I'm accepted I get to worship I get to hear terrific music, I get to um, listen to a wonderful sermon, and on top of that, I even get a little humor in there, and I just really enjoy it. I look forward to every Sunday. feels like all family. Uh, when you come here, everyone is very welcoming, um, very warm, and it feels like a place that I can call home. I feel like every Sunday, uh, is revival. I mean, I feel like every Sunday we get the special, the special guy, the special preacher. And everybody up on stage just blew me away with the music ability and um, and the and the positive emotions and actions. I mean, you could tell it's not fake. It's it's real singing to God from the heart. It's true worship. What does the Ridge um, do that differs from other churches that you've been to? I don't. Feel the pressure of some of the churches that I've been to, and not necessarily just this area, but I've been to them in several different states, and it's just so much more laid back. You don't have to worry about when you walk in the door, oh, have I got the right clothes on? Um, is somebody going to look down on me because maybe I didn't carry my Bible today? or I was in Sunday school class or whatever. And it's just, like you say, it's home. I see, I see, I drive past other churches and I see on their marquees, everyone welcome. Uh, come, as you, come as you are. And I feel like um, that you, actually, you know, that's preached here. Come as you are. I feel like anyone can walk in here and feel comfortable. And, and, and in fact, I've seen that. 
I feel like other churches I've been to in the past, for me personally, it's been a lot more about going to see and be seen. Um, it's a lot about obedience and just, you know, kind of checking off the boxes. Coming to the Ridge is, uh, it's a really positive experience. It's, a, it's more about a relationship with Christ, with each other. It's, it's not so much just going through the motions, um, empty words, things like that. And you can feel it in the room, too. I feel like it's, it's a very similar experience for everybody that's here. Uh, we come here to, um, to worship and, you know, have a good experience. And it's, it's much more profound. You leave with something more than what you walked in the door with whenever you leave here. What is one of your favorite parts about the Ridge? All of it is my favorite part. From the time that we get out of our vehicle and we walk in, the person standing there at the door that's saying, welcome, the person that hands the bulletin out to us, the person that's making the coffee and the donuts, to the person that all the way through, um, you know, they always say it takes a village to raise a child. Um, I kind of look at it like that with the Ridge. I think it takes everybody behind the scenes, everything that makes this Ridge what it is and, and I don't think, think that, that one part can be higher than the other part if that makes sense to you guys. So what is your favorite part about the Ridge Church? Uh, what I like the most is the, is the message. Um, I feel that um, Matt has an interesting way of presenting uh, the message every week and I feel like uh, for me um, I, I, I've read the Bible and I've heard these stories and, and heard them preached before, but Matt has an interesting way of communicating um, like no one I've ever heard before. And um, I also love the fact that the um, gospel message is delivered every Sunday because I think about those individuals who maybe have walked in the church for the first time um, and need to hear that. So how has the Ridge impacted you? For me the Ridge has impacted me in the sense that I do feel my relationship with uh, God is a lot stronger. I can tell a difference in myself. Uh, people around me has even said they can tell a difference in me. I feel like it could be kind of a bold statement but I definitely feel like coming to the church has really helped take the edge off of my anxiety. I suffered from a lot of anxiety for a really long time. Um, tried so many different things to try to help it, medications, you name it. Uh, nothing ever really worked for me. Um, and honestly, since I've been coming here, it's just made such a big impact. Um, from just normal day-to-day -day anxiety, um, you know, even like those little panic attacks that sneak up on some people that you don't really know what to do with, and honestly being afraid of storms, even that level of fear and not having control of things, just having a solid um, space to just ground yourself in a relationship with God and, and know that, you know, you don't have control over everything and you just have to have faith and trust. It's really made such a big difference in something that I haven't been able to really do anything about in any other way. Hey Ridge Church, are you ready to see who's next? Welcome to week two of interviews of how the Ridge has impacted your life.
worship and Come here. I've been up in the mountains freezing to death come back and y'all got me burning up it's so good to be home good to see you. we're gonna sing another one here <laughs>
Glory. Oh, we had to change this last one up because I don't know where Blake's at. But he's, he's a little sickly this morning. Got some sign and stuff. So I said that. That way you know if we mess it up real bad, we have to practice. But then if we do a good job, you'd be like, wow, they didn't practice. So here we go. You know this one well called Red Letter Singing this. There I was on death row. you. I was just hoping someone would say that. <laughs> you know, they say, I hear people say sometimes, you know, my church is in the woods or my church is on the river, on the lake. I'm telling you, last Sunday I was in the woods in church, 9,500 feet up a mountain, close to the Lord. No, but uh, it ain't the same. I miss being here so bad. And, uh, you know, I was out there where there was nobody to talk to but my horse and the Lord. And, uh, Leroy, my old stud Leroy. I'll give you three guesses what song was stuck in my head all week. 
But uh, anyway, it's just so good to be back at home with you, and I genuinely did miss you, and so thankful to be here. We're going to let the kids go, man. It's tight up in here, so let's dismiss the, ch- the children real quick for Kids Church. Give these overgrown adults some space to breathe. All right. Man, I thought that'd make more room than that. So we need to increase the age. How about up to 21? You go out to kids' church. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's bow for prayer and ask God's blessing over this offering. Father, it is so good to be here today with your people. Lord, I feel like I'm just coming home. It's a family reunion, and I wasn't gone that long, but I sure did miss being here. And so thank you for this space that you've established for these people that you've gathered. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would move among us today. I pray that you'd work in our hearts. I pray that you'd deal with us exactly where we need to be dealt with. Lord, you know exactly, specifically, Lord, what's going on in our hearts in this very moment, an hour, this season of our lives. And so I pray that you'd deal with us where we're at. I pray that you'd do the work that no man could ever do. And Lord, continue to be glorified, continue to bless and use this church. I pray that you'd take this offering given multiply it for your use. I pray that you'd supply the needs of those who give. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. this morning. Go to John chapter number six, please. John chapter six. You ever watching those survival shows? You ever see that? Where they, they, uh, if you stay out longer than anybody else, they'll drop like 20 people off in the middle of nowhere. And if you stay out, like if you, if you're the, the dude or the whatever, you know, the gal, okay, women are equal, right? Whatever. Uh, Whoever stays out the longest wins whatever, like a half a million dollars. Everybody, how many of y'all watch those shows or have seen them? That was me this past week, living that. I'm just kidding. But, you know, I watch those shows and I, um, I've seen guys on there, like grown men, tough, gruff, you know what I'm saying, live off the land, can build a fire with two sticks and a, and a rock, you know what I'm saying, those type of guys. I've seen those guys on there, they're always self-filming and, and uh, I, I've, I've watched them, half a million, million dollars on the line start crying like five-year-old kids, you know what I'm saying? Not because they're starving, not because they're tired, not because they're thirsty, but because they miss their family. And on this side of the TV, I'm always like, dude, it's half a million dollars. Surely you can make it another three weeks, you know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you right now, I couldn't do it. It wasn't, it wasn't the cold, it wasn't, I miss my family so bad sitting out there. Normally when I take trips, and I mean you, <laughs> spiritually speaking, I miss my family. No, I miss my wife and kids so daggum bad. I mean, I was out there about day three going, <laughs> I wouldn't care how much money is on the line, I'd have come home. 
But uh, it was awesome. Good time to get together. Had plenty of time to think about John chapter 6. And so uh, we'll, we'll see what we can shovel out today. But it's, it's so good to be home. Got back yesterday morning. Um, oh, did I mention I did kill an elk? I don't know if I threw that out there or not. Yeah, I did. Um, just a little side note. But um, it, was, it was incredible, incredible time. Appreciate the Cartwright family inviting me along and uh, enjoyed getting to know them for the most part. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. Me and Joe were bonded from now on out. But anyway, we're in John chapter 6. Go to verse number 60 with me. What I'm going to do today, so um, there are a lot of directions I could go. There's so much content in this chapter, um, and there are a lot of different ways I could, I could take it. Uh, frankly, I could, I could probably just draw a lot of analogies and illustrations out. Jesus feeds 5,000 in this chapter. He walks on water. Uh, the disciples are fearful and afraid. I mean, there's a lot of things that take place in John chapter 6 that we could sort of extrapolate illustrations and analogies from. But I want to I actually just give you the brass tacks of this chapter because in reality, it's hardcore. I'm telling you, Jesus really, really cuts deep. Um, he pushes back real hard against the religious ideologies of his day, and we've dealt with a lot of that. But I want to share something with you today that, again, will be, will be sort of just, uh, I'm kind of stripping the chapter down and want to give you the exact meaning in its context. So start with me in verse 60, and then again, we'll work our way back through here. Verse number 60 of John chapter 6, it says, there, it says therefore, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to draw your attention to a statement made in verse number 60, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll share the context with you in just a moment. But in verse number 60, his own disciples looked at, what, at Jesus based on what he had just said and based on what he had just done, and he, they said, this is a hard saying. What you have just presented is difficult, and even we who are for you, we're behind you, we believe in you, but this is tough. This is a hard saying. So this morning, I want to just preach on that subject and kind of take that as the theme of John chapter 6. This is a hard saying. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would take something that's very difficult, perhaps for us to process, because often we, we, we try to fit everything through the funnel, through the, through the lens and look at it through the scope of our own philosophies and understanding. But today, Lord, I pray that your spirit would strip all of that away and that you would help us to see with spiritual eyes, help us to understand something that is very difficult for us to naturally uh, understand and, and ingest. And Lord, I pray that you'd use this time to help us grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray if there's someone here today who does not know Jesus as their personal Savior, that today would be the day that they would step across the threshold of faith and that they would believe on him and be saved. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So John 6, I'm telling you, there is so much that happens in this chapter. First of all, it's a very, very long chapter as far as verses are concerned. There are 71 verses in John chapter number 6, and so it's an exhaustive chapter of the Bible, but there's, there's a lot of heavy things that takes place in John chapter number 6. Now, you're aware of the fact, everywhere Jesus went, he had at this time great crowds following him. Now, as fickle uh, as human nature can be, uh, at sometimes the, the crowds would grow, at sometimes, at other times they would dwindle. At this time, Jesus had a great following. Everywhere he went, even when he'd go try to hide, Jesus tried to hide from people sometimes, right? He'd go up in the mountain. 
and try to hide from people. Absolutely no comparison there to what I just did. But even when Jesus would go try to hide, they would, they would find him. They'd follow him. And that was what was taking place in John 6. Just great droves of people following him, coming after him, everywhere he went. So I want you to notice some things that happen in John chapter 6. If your Bible has the sort of breakdown, the outline headings that mine has, if you'll notice in John 6 at the top of the chapter, it says the feeding of the 5,000. So you're aware of the fact that it's here, uh, that Jesus is teaching and all these people are out there. And it says they didn't have anything to eat. The disciples said, uh, Jesus told the disciples, make them sit down. We're going to feed them. Uh, and the disciples said, well, where have it take so much money to feed such a crowd? He said, well, what do you have? They said oh we've got these five loaves and two fish that this little boy brought to us he said have everybody sit down they set everybody down and Jesus broke the five loaves of bread and the two small fish and it says that he that he fed above 5,000 at one time that was 5,000 men not including women and children right and so upwards of 10 to 15 possibly 20,000 people Jesus fed with five loaves and two fish I don't know where you come from that, that that's pretty impressive to me I have a hard enough time feeding five kids all right, Jesus fed above 5,000 at one time with a little boy's lunch. Very impressive miracle that Jesus brought. And then it says in verse 15, the little heading says, Jesus walks on the sea. If you remember, Jesus put his disciples into a ship, told them to go to the other side. As they were sailing to the other side, a great storm uh, came up on the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. They thought he was a ghost. But when he got close, Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. You know the story. He calms the storm. The sea becomes as smooth as glass, and the storm ceases. Jesus calms the storm on the sea, winds up on the other side with his disciples, and the miracle was so public, honestly, we think about just the disciples being there. But when he got to the other side, all the people said, hey, we know that the disciples got in the ship and you were up in the mountains. So how'd you, you know what I'm saying? Like, how'd you make a connection with your disciples and get over here to the other side? And so once again, Jesus brings together this great miracle. He, 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 ex he exposes the fact that he has power even over the elements. Like the, the wind and the seas obeyed his voice. Once again, I don't know where you come from, but that's pretty awesome to me, Right? I've tried it. It's never worked. Y'all have been fishing and a big storm blows in. You're thinking, dead gone. It's going to be a rough ride back to, the, back to the dock, right? I've done it, man. I've stood on the helm of the ship and said, peace, be still. <laughs> didn't work. I did it on the Sea of Galilee. I thought maybe there was some magic. It didn't work. So I'm impressed, honestly, that he has power over the elements. He calmed the sea. He walked on water. I don't know. Again, it might take more to impress you, but I'm impressed. By that miracle. He'd done some amazing things. Again, these things were not done in secret. He did it publicly. He, he exposed the fact that he was God in the flesh. But I want you to notice what happens in verse number 26. So all these people that had sort of, you know, this caravan that was following him around, you know, they came to him. And uh, in verse 26, here's what Jesus said to them. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now, now let's just pause right there for a second, okay? So I don't know what you think about when you try to imagine, if you've ever tried to imagine what it was like to be there at the, at the feeding. Can you imagine being there, one of the people who ate of the five loaves and two fish as Jesus distributed to the multitudes. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but when I think about it, I don't really think this, this was like a subpar meal. I'm thinking like this was the bomb. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the guys were coming up to Jesus going like, hey, what'd you use on that fish? You use Andy seasoning? I mean, <laughs> would you fry that? Did you broil it? How'd you cook that? that was good. I'm telling you, this is like, this is like good top-notch meal. Jesus doesn't serve second-rate stuff. All right? <laughs> I mean, these hush puppies, he ain't never had nothing like it. Five loaves, two fish. I mean, he, he passes this out, and this was good food. This was better than anything they normally got. These people, listen, these Jews were normally just eating broiled fish cooked over fire. So however Jesus fixed it, I doubt he had a deep fryer. All right, I don't want to. <laughs> but however he fixed it, it was amazing. It was so amazing. Now, again, try to imagine this. It was so amazing. These people didn't have Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and all that stuff on every corner so it was so amazing that he says to them later he says you're not following me because you want something eternal 
you're following me because you got your belly full of, uh, of the fish and the bread, and you're just here to get something, receive something physical. So immediately in John 6, Jesus begins revealing the fact that there was a problem with their attitude. Look in verse number 28. It says, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Therefore they said to him, now watch this, okay? I've only built this up a little bit, but they had seen amazing things up to this point. Watch what they say to Jesus in verse 30. Here's the audacity. They said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? I don't, you want me to pull a rabbit out of my hat? What do you want? What sign? Didn't, didn't you just eat? Didn't 10 to 15,000 of you just eat from the little sack lunch of a child and filled up and took leftovers home? And you're asking me what kind of sign I'm going to show you? Look, in verse 30, or, or in verse 20, or verse 30, they said, what work will you do? Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread to eat. So here they come to Jesus, and he's, he's walked on water, he's healed the blind, he's cleansed people with leprosy, which was an incurable disease. He's, he's, he's calmed the storm. He's fed multitudes with a little boy's lunch, and they're asking him, what type of sign are you going to give us so that we can see and believe in you? Here's my question. What is it exactly that you're looking for? You want a sign? If God gave you a sign, would you believe? You remember one of the great themes of the, of the Gospel of John is what do you believe? There comes a point when every person in their life has to choose and decide what they believe in. In fact, there's a place in the Gospel of John, I may spend some time on it later, where, where Jesus is teaching and preaching to the multitudes. And at the end of the chapter, at the end of his discourse, it says, and every man went to his own house. In other words, at the end of the day, they had to go home with what they believed in. They had to rest their head on their own pillow at night under their own roof with their own family. They had, to, they had to live with what they believed. And at some point in this journey called life, we all have to make a decision about what we are going to believe in. So, so Jesus had done all these great things and they still wanted more. What sign? I mean, what would it take to get you to believe in him? What are you looking for, an effective messenger that can communicate a message in a way that moves your heart? You're looking for some miracle? What would make a difference really in your life if you cannot believe the simple message of the gospel? It was a problem with their attitude. They didn't need another miracle. They didn't need God to speak. To, uh, if you'll speak to me one more time. They didn't need that. They had a problem with their heart, and Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter, and he says, look, it wasn't Moses that fed you in the wilderness, it was my father, and now you're witnessing him work through me, and you still won't believe. You're seeing firsthand what you heard your ancestors tell you about, and you still won't believe. What will it take to get your attention? What will it take to get you to believe this message? There was a problem with their attitude. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there will no sign be given unto them except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said, the only miracle, the only sign you're going to get is when I conquer death and rise from the, from the grave on the third day. He said, that's the only sign. Which, by the way, they had already seen multitudes of signs up until that point. But Jesus said, I I'll show you a sign. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat death. How about that? Would that do it for you? Now, look, I know those of us living 2,000 years later are thinking, well, yeah, if I saw something like that, I would believe. Well, would you really? Would you? Would you believe if you saw Jesus himself get up out of the grave? Because, by the way, there were thousands upon thousands of people in his day that saw him post-resurrection. Watched him die on a cross, saw his blood spilling from his hands and from his feet and from his riven side. They witnessed it firsthand, witnessed the fact that he resurrected from the dead. You are aware that Jesus didn't rise in secret. 
He resurrected from the dead publicly and walked the earth as a man for 40 days and 40 nights after his resurrection, and there were still people who rejected him. So would that really make a difference? If we did perform some miracle, would you believe? Would you, would you then put your faith in Jesus if somehow we could, we could show you a sign? I don't think so. I don't think so, because Jesus said an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. What that means, you know what an adulterer is? That's somebody who's never satisfied with the relationship they're in. He said, I can give you another miracle, but that won't satisfy you. I can show you another sign, but that won't satisfy you. I can, I can put another prophet, another speaker in your life. I can put someone else in your pathway, but until you make the decision to trust in me, it's not going to change a thing. You've got to make the choice, and it comes down to faith. There was a problem with their attitude. Jesus, what sign will you show us? Well, what do you want? Why don't you tell me what I can do, what I can say to get you to believe this message? I want you to notice this. Number two, in John chapter 6, there was a problem with their approach. Look in verse number 34. Here's what they did. You remember uh, two weeks ago, I, I talked to you. The message was, who's next? We talked about the woman at the well. She said to him, when Jesus said, uh, if you asked of me, I would have given you living water, wherein if you drink, you'll never thirst again. Her immediate response was, give us, or give me this water, then I'll never thirst again. You remember that? It's very similar. In John 6, when Jesus made the statements that we just looked at, in verse number 34, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. We'll take it. Soul. You convince me, I'll take it. But here's what Jesus said. He said, I am the bread of life. Now you're thinking back to the fried fish and the, and the bread. It's probably broiled fish, I get that. You're thinking back to the meal. He said, what I'm saying to you is that I'm the bread that came down from heaven. You're talking about the manna that your fathers ate that sustained them physically he said, what I'm telling you is that the man of my father sent from heaven was a foreshadow of the fact that one day I, who am the true bread, would come down from heaven. And you're missing it. You're missing the whole point. I am the bread of life, verse 35. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So here's what Jesus said. He said, you're looking for a physical solution when it's a spiritual problem. You think if you just got your belly filled one more time, you'd be satisfied. You're thinking that if you just saw one more sign, that would do it. If God would just work in your life one more, if he'd just give you one more little nudge, one more little inkling, one more little directive that this is the right thing, if God would just do that, he said, what you're trying to do is you're looking for a physical solution to a spiritual problem. When in reality, the hunger of your heart, the thirst of your heart, what you really need is love and acceptance. And you're never going to find that in anything in this world. I don't care if you have the best meal. I don't care if you're in the best relationship. I don't care if you have the best job, live in the finest house. He said, there's nothing's going to satisfy that. And your approach is completely wrong. So you're seeking physical food, but I'm telling you, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and you're not going to find what you're looking for anywhere in this world. I am the answer. And so as they sought satisfaction, and their approach was to satisfy a physical need, Jesus said, I can, I can supply all your physical needs, and it won't change. You can get a better job. You can get a better spouse. Right? Somebody said, no, that was the right answer. <laughs> But you're never going to find satisfaction until what really is empty inside you is filled. I'm the bread which came down from heaven. Their approach to Jesus was, was, was physical. It was carnal. They were trying to find some way 
to satisfy the need of their heart when what they really needed was to know they were loved and know they were accepted by the God who created them to find their purpose is in him, that their calling is in him, that all things are in him and he consists and he's the power that they need and he's everything that they need. He said, you're missing it all. If I showed you another sign, it wouldn't make a difference. If you heard another sermon, it wouldn't make a difference. If you had a more eloquent worship team, it wouldn't change a thing. He said, what are you really looking for? Because when you find me, everything will start to make sense and all those questions begin to be answered and all the pieces will fall in place. But when you're approaching it from the wrong aspect, from the wrong vantage point, you're never going to find satisfaction. So there was a problem with their attitude. There was a problem with their approach. But finally, I want to show you this. There was a problem with their ability. This wasn't a matter of, of may I. It was a matter of can I. Now watch, and I'll I'll explain what I mean by that. In verse number 41, here's what Jesus goes on to say. And you remember we started off looking at where his disciples said in verse 60, hey, this this is a difficult thing that you just said. This is a hard saying. And at that point, because of what Jesus said that we're about to read, at that point, the Bible tells us in verse 66, John chapter 6, verse number 66, I don't get caught up on numerology, but that's the number of man, 666, okay, uh, edit that because that's just hokey conspiracy theories, right? <laughs> but it says at that time, many of his disciples walked no more with him. This is what caused them to bounce. What we're about to read is what caused, remember, the great multitudes following him, This is what caused them to say, no, nope, can't handle it, that can't be true. In fact, again, his own disciples, I'm talking about of the 12, let's scratch Judas, the 11 that were legit, came to Jesus and said, this this is tough, this is difficult, in so much that Jesus flipped the script on them and said, are you going to go away too? You want to leave too? Because what I just said to you is truth. Whether you like it or not. So I'm about to show you some stuff that's pretty hard to understand and it's difficult for our human minds to process. But watch what Jesus said. In verse 41, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now, here is where, this is why I said there was a problem with their ability. Here's what Jesus said that that they just couldn't handle. He said, it's not, it's not that you, that you, that you just don't have permission to come to me. It's that you don't have the power to come to me. It's not that you just lack the initiative. It's that you lack the the inherent ability to approach me unless my Father in heaven brings you to me. Now you remember he had already told them all that the Father gives to me shall come to me and they that come to me I will in no wise cast out. He said anybody who comes to me and believes in me is never going to be rejected. You come to Jesus, you'll never be rejected. He said all that the Father gives me shall come to me and they that come to me I'll in no wise cast out. They'll become my children, they'll be my sons and my daughters. I'll receive you into my family. He said the problem is not that you have no no aptitude, no desire. The problem is that you have no ability. To come to me on your own. Now here's the difficult saying. This is why his disciples said this. This this is a hard saying. Who can understand this? Who can know this? He said in your own natural ability. You can't even approach me. In your own natural power. You can't come to me. Did you know you cannot. Come to God. Unless God himself. Intervenes in your life. And draws you personally to him. Now, just a few of you agreed with that and shook your head and said, amen, that's right, because this is a difficult thing to understand. This is a hard saying. 
Because in our human minds, we think like this. We think, you know what? One of these days, I tell you what, I'm, gonna just, I'm not going to do it now. But one of these days, I am going to get saved. I'm going to do it. Nobody in their right mind wants to go to hell. We took a survey this morning and said, hey, we got tickets for heaven and we got tickets for hell. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind is going to go, hey, give me that hell stuff. What you talking about? You know, first class, second, I don't care. Nobody in their right mind is going to say that. We all, we all naturally think, I'm going to go to God one of these days. I'm going I'm to trust in Jesus. I'm going to give my heart to God. I'm going to do all that. I'm going to do that. The problem is you don't have the ability to do that. You don't. Here's what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says, The natural man receives not the things of God. The natural man, in our natural state, in our, of our own natural elements, we don't have the ability to process spiritual things because naturally we are of the earth. We understand earthly things. We can calculate earthly things. We can philosophize from a, from a physical, carnal point of view. But when it comes to spiritual things, we can't process. We don't have the power. In so much and to the extent that Jesus said, no one. That includes you and that includes me. No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. Now listen, y'all understand the difference between may and can, don't you? My fourth grade teacher taught me this, Mrs. McDonald. Fourth grade teacher taught me this because I'd raise my hand and I'd say, Mrs. McDonald, can I go to the bathroom? And she'd say, I don't know, can you? And I'd say, I can and I will, and I'm about to. <laughs> Ask me the right way, Matthew. Mrs. McDonald, may I go to the bathroom? Yes, you may. What was she doing? She was teaching me the difference between permissibility and ability. Can, can I? Do I have the ability? Yeah. May I? Do I have the permission? Yeah. Jesus didn't say no man may come to me. He said no one has the ability, nobody has the power to come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. This is what we call divine intervention. That it takes God through his spirit to work in the heart of a human being to enlighten that individual's mind and bring them to a place where they see their need for someone outside of themselves to bring redemption into their lives. It takes God through the Spirit drawing us. Old time preachers used to call this Holy Ghost conviction, meaning the Spirit of God dealt with you in such a way that you specifically knew that when Jesus died on the cross, he died with you on his heart and in his mind, and he was looking ahead in time and had you in mind when he shed his blood. And the Spirit of God has to bring that truth to light in your heart for you to have the ability to put your faith in Jesus. Now here's how deep Jesus drove this stake. In verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except who has come from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and are dead. He said they got the physical food they were looking for. But in verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now watch. They couldn't get past physical comprehension. Because in verse 52, the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Human reasoning. You remember Nicodemus, John chapter 3? Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus goes, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he climb the second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
In the the exact same fashion, this is just the way we calculate things, humanly speaking. In the exact same fashion, they, they they talked among themselves and said, what's this guy talking about? How are we going to eat this? Are we going to become cannibals now? Are we going to eat his flesh? What's all, this, what's all this talk? What's all this nonsense he's spewing out? Jesus doubles down. In verse 53, he said, most assuredly, he said, I'm telling you without a doubt, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He said, you think that bothered him? You think what I just said bothered you? Let me, let me say it to you like this. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now at that point, no doubt, if Jesus had a deacon board, they'd have been calling a meeting. And hold up. What are you talking, what are you, Jesus, you just told those people Unless they ate your flesh and drank your blood, they'd die and they'd perish and they'd be annihilated unless they ate your flesh and drank your blood. Did you really say that? Yeah, I said it. And I'm going to say it again. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't go to heaven. Now, that's funny because some of y'all are trying to hang with me here and go, oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> some of y'all are going, what? What? I didn't know that was in the Bible. What are, we, what are we supposed to do? What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. First of all, Jesus already said, you won't get this unless my Father enlightens your mind and, you, and then you'll get it. You won't get this till the Holy Spirit, the Spirit deals with you and it makes sense because you can't come to me unless my Father draws you. It's not that he doesn't want you It's not that he doesn't love you, because he already told us in John 3, 16, God loves the whole world. He loves everybody. And he gave his only begotten son for everybody. So it's not an issue of whether God loves you or not. It's the fact that there are only certain seasons in your life when your heart is tender enough, and the Spirit of God is specifically dealing with you in such a way that you can comprehend this. So Jesus said, if that bothered you, let me just restate it like this. I said what I said. I said what I said, and I meant what I said, and I'm going to repeat what I said. And I'm going to say it in an even harsher way because you can't say the right thing to the wrong person. You can't say the wrong thing to the right person. Did you catch that? You can't say the right thing to the wrong person. You can't say the wrong thing to the right person. Here's what I mean by it. If the Spirit of God was dealing with your heart this morning about your need to be born again, I could preach on tithing and you would come to Jesus. Because it's not the voice of the messenger It's the message of the gospel that changes a person's life. And so Jesus said, I'm going to just say, I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to be even more blunt, and I'm going to be even more descriptive, and I'm going to see how they handle it. Well, they didn't handle it very well. But here's what Jesus said. He said, the the words that I speak to you, look at verse number 63. In verse number 63, he said, it is the spirit who gives life The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you who do not believe. Here's what he said. He said, look, I'm not telling you you you're going to physically eat my body. Weird. That's not what I was saying. I'm not saying you need to physically drink my blood. In fact, the Bible forbids that. So so I'm not talking to you about physical things. He said, but because your mind is so stuck on physical, because you're so obsessed about physical things, he said, I'm going to say something to you that I mean in a spiritual manner, but you're so so flipped the other direction and you can't see spiritual things. He said, I'm going to say something to you that that is so outlandish, you're going to take it literally. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have eternal life. He said, I mean, unless you receive me just as I am, wholly and completely, you won't see heaven. Because it's not a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Buddha that gets you there. It's not a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Allah that gets you there. 
Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the only God who died on a cross to redeem his creation. He's the only king who had to die for his kingdom to begin. He said, unless you receive me fully and completely holy just as I am, he said, you won't have eternal life. You don't take a little piece of Jesus and add him to your religious resume. You realize that Jesus is your only hope. It's not your religion or baptism or sacraments. It's Jesus. And he said, until you realize that and understand that, until your eyes are open and you believe that, you'll never know life. You're going to keep seeking satisfaction in relationships and in pill bottles and in liquor bottles. He said, you're going to keep seeking another relationship and another promotion, and you'll keep finding yourself empty and broken inside because the only one who can heal you is me. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. It wasn't about your father's receiving physical sustenance. What good does physical supply do you if your eternal tank is empty? What good does having everything in this world do for you? What would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus said, unless you realize that I am the way, the truth, and the life, you won't know eternal life. No man can come to me except my Father which has sent me draw him. Let me try to explain that to you in the most practical way I possibly can. Naturally, using the scriptures, the Bible says once again, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. If you'll think about your own life, if you'll just reflect on your life for just a moment, you are not naturally inclined to spiritual things. You're not. I'm not. Never was. We don't naturally wake up one day and go, man, I think I'm going to become one of them area Christians. I like them. Good people. I think I'm going to become like them. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to take my day off on Sunday. And I'm going to get up early in the morning. And I'm going to go to that church. I'm going to listen to that, that guy talk. We're going to sing songs that I don't know, and they don't play on the radio. That sounds like a good idea. We don't naturally do that. Matter of fact, what normally happens is some things come into our lives, and we find ourselves at this intersection of emptiness and loneliness, and we realize that there's got to be something more. And somehow, some way, somebody shares with us an invitation to come visit church or maybe they share with us specifically the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for our sins that he was buried and that he rose again for our justification maybe somebody sits down with you and shares Christ with you maybe somehow some way somebody speaks with you and finally and suddenly that message of the gospel starts to resonate and make sense as my story goes I was raised with it driving back roads coming home yesterday morning past an old church and man I remember hadn't seen that church since I was a little kid my dad used to take me there to gospel singing man I heard this stuff from the time I was a child I cut my teeth on a red back hymnal I was raised with it heard the gospel from the time I was a little bitty child could even understand language I'd heard the gospel amazing grace how sweet the sound I'd heard that from the time I was a child but wandered through life aimlessly for years not giving God a second thought looking for another high looking for another relationship looking for some other thrill until the Spirit of God began unveiling in my heart that there was something more missing and there was nothing in this world that would ever bring me satisfaction and I began to wander by my own volition so I thought back into that same church house where I heard that preacher preach that same message but the difference was this time it began to make sense to me and I began to understand that look man this this whole concept of Jesus dying on a cross and the empty tomb and the Easter story and the Christmas story and all these other things that heard, there, there was more to it than just being some fairy tale or fictitious religious concept. There was something personal to me about it. 
began to ring true in my heart. I began to understand that there was a thirst in me that no one and nothing could satisfy. And that same message, John 3.16, as simple as it may be to some of us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That message began to ring true and I understood that, listen, Jesus didn't come to this world to condemn me. He came into this world to love me and to accept me and to bring me into his family and to forgive me for all the wrongs that I'd done and give me purpose and give me life and give me a home in heaven. It began to be real to me. As if a light went off. I begin to see truth and understand things. Listen to me, that's not natural. And however your story has played out, it's not because you just somehow one day said, ah, I think I'm going to try this. It's because the Spirit of God has your address. And he's come to you personally. This is what Jesus meant when he said, no man can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. He said, the Father is going to deal with every single human upon the face of the earth at some point in your life, during some season of your life. God is going to draw you in. Here's where you step in. It's during that season that you'll have a choice to make. Am I going to just continue to turn a deaf ear? Am I going to continue to seek another sign, another sermon, some other speaker, some other song that maybe will resonate with me? Jesus is saying, what do you want? What do you need? What, what will it take to convince you? What will it take to convince you? If I'd write a message in the sky, would you believe? If you could see Jesus with your physical eyes, would you believe? If you witnessed some miracle or some rabbit in a hat experience, would, would you believe then? He said, I'm convinced, no. Because God's given you enough information up to this point. The Spirit of God has brought this home in such a way, in, with such clarity, that you know what you need to do right here, right now. The night that I got saved, I was a 19-year-old boy, broken, lost. I didn't have to quit hanging out with my old buddy as soon as I quit slinging dope and smoking it. They didn't want to hang out with me, so I was lonely. Didn't fit in with the Christian kids at, a, at the church I was going to because they were nerds. You know church kids are nerds, right? I didn't fit in with them because I was cool, as you can tell. I didn't fit in with the crowd outside the church. I didn't fit in with the crowd inside the church. And I was lost and hurting and broken and empty inside. And that night that the Spirit of God dealt with my heart. And there wasn't a question in my mind what I needed to do. I knew I was lost, and the words almost choked me just to say it in front of God. No one else was there, but just between me and God to say, God, I am lost. Just to admit that it took such humility, took such brokenness for me at least. But as soon as I made that statement from my heart, not even audibly, but just in my heart, as soon as I said, I'm lost, it was like chains began to fall from my soul. And then I said, God, I know that Jesus died on the cross, and I believe it. I know that he rose from the dead, and I believe it, and I accept you. What you did for me, the gift that you've given me, the love that you've shown toward me, God, I accept that. And when I said that, a peace filled my heart that I'd never found. And as the old song says, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. In that moment, listen, it's not about a feeling, and I'm not trying to say that it is. But in that moment, I felt something so real that God loved me, <laughs> that Jesus died on the cross, not so we could have a flannel graph or some Hollywood production, but because he loved me. He stood in my place and he took all the punishment that I deserved. He did all that for me and it was so real and it's been so real for 22 and a half years now. Jesus died on the cross for me. Listen to me. Jesus died on the cross for you. And it doesn't matter if your daddy's a preacher, your mom's a Sunday school teacher, if you've been in church all your life, you sing on the worship team. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. Every human being upon the face of the earth has to come to this point in their journey. When you make a choice as the Spirit of God is dealing with your heart, 
whether or not you'll trust in Jesus or whether you'll just continue to push him away. Man, they used to sing a song at church when I was growing up that haunted me. It was based off of a verse in the book of Acts where King Agrippa said to the Apostle Paul, almost, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. They used to sing a song at invitation time. Mike, you'll remember this. The song said, almost persuaded. Now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Almost. Almost. I almost, I almost accepted that. I almost, I almost walked forward. I almost prayed the prayer. I almost did it. I almost did it. But then there was a line in the song that said, Seems now some soul to say, Go spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on thee I'll call. In other words, one of these days when it's easier for me, God, I'll, I'll, I'll get a hold of you. Jesus said the problem is you won't get a hold of God when God's not getting a hold of you because you won't even think about it then. You have to come when the Spirit's calling. You have to come while the Spirit is dealing with your heart. You have to come, as I said before, the old preachers called it Holy Ghost Conviction when God's Spirit speaks to you. You have to move in that window of time and trust in Him. You say, why? Is it because God won't receive me any other time? No, it's because you won't receive Him any other time naturally naturally we're not inclined to go toward God let's all stand together this morning our heads are bowed and eyes are closed maybe you're here today and the spirit of God is dealing with you maybe that's you I'm talking to maybe this is your moment maybe this is your time the apostle Paul wrote down In the book, the letter to the Corinthian church, he said, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know why he said that? I used to misquote that verse. I used to say, behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. That's not what he said. He said, now is the day of salvation. In other words, you only have this moment. And y'all know I'm not a high-pressure preacher. I don't do that. But there is an element of urgency upon the gospel. There's an element of urgency where we need to move while the Spirit's calling. So I'm not even telling you what to do. I'm not saying raise your hand this time. I'm not doing that. I'm not asking you to come forward. All I'm asking you to do is search your own heart and you respond as the Spirit of God is speaking to you. If He's speaking to your heart, you don't need me to pray a prayer for you. You can call on Him. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So as we bow and as we pray, you pray from your own heart in the presence of God. Heavenly Father, we come. And in Jesus' name, I pray that your spirit would deal with hearts as only you can. Father, I pray that you would bring truth to life as only you can. I pray that you'd call each person by name. Today that's outside of your grace, Lord, I pray that your spirit would draw them in. You know me, you know them, God, you know every single one of us. And you know right now what we need, and so I pray that you do what only you can do. We commit this time to you in Jesus' precious holy name we pray.